I herewith return to you your letter received this day's mail, which is of a character that must terminate all personal intercourse between us. And I enjoin it upon you never to address me again on any subject whatsoever, not strictly relevant to the discharge of official duty of my countrymen. Marmaduke Burrow to John Baldwin, January 6th, 1838. When Marmaduke Burrow wrote these words in 1838, he was angry. He was the American consul in Veracruz, Mexico, and his constituents were trying to take advantage of him. Or rather, one particular constituent, John Baldwin. Burroughs' disagreements with Baldwin would become so heated that the dispute would end up being heard in the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm Abby Mullen, and today on Consolation Prize, we take a look at Americans in Veracruz. We'll look at how they ask their consuls to uphold their rights as Americans. For consuls like Burrow, sometimes the line wasn't quite clear between legitimate intervention on behalf of an American citizen and diplomatic or personal overreach. So, how do these consuls draw that line? Before we get to the consuls, we need to talk about the Americans in Mexico. These days, when we think about people traveling back and forth between the United States and Mexico, we're focused on people coming from Mexico to the United States. But in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, Americans were heading into Mexico. Mexico, interestingly, was a land of opportunity for many U.S. Americans. Uh, And U.S. Americans were moving all over the continent at that time. And many moved right over the international border. Quite a few moved into Texas, um, several thousand in the 1820s and the early 1830s moved into Texas. They established really their own settlements there. And really, it was almost like a Western extension of Louisiana. Many moved as merchants engaging in international trade, living in port cities, some living in interior cities. But as I got into my research, I was really surprised by how many moved for other things as well. So you had quite a good number of artisans moving to Mexico. For example, uh, Robert Plummer opened up a cabinet making operation in Zacatecas in the late 1820s. And you had carriage makers in Mexico City. And then in the 1830s, especially in the 1840s, there were people moving to Mexico to work in industrial operations, whether U.S. owned or Mexican owned. The Patterson Machine Company from Patterson, New Jersey, actually opened up a factory in Puebla in the 1840s. Also, you even had um, U.S. Americans join the Mexican Army and Navy, in the, particularly in the 1820s and 30s. David McKenzie studies the history of Americans in Mexico in the 19th century. Most Americans who moved to Mexico moved into the borderlands with the United States, into places like what we know now as Texas and California. But David estimates that at least a thousand Americans moved further south, into the land that is still Mexico today. And they came into Mexico because the Mexican government invited them. The Mexican government wanted immigrants in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s for really two purposes. One was to colonize land that, uh, like Texas and the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, where the Mexican government felt like there were too few loyal citizens there. But the other purpose was also to bring in skills and capital. So artisans, merchants, you know, people, people with money, there was really a vacuum after the um, end of the colonial period, and especially when Mexico expelled a lot of its Spanish-born residents in the late 1820s. The Mexican government wanted, um, they wanted foreigners who would assimilate as Mexican citizens and who would not have their loyalties to their home countries. So, um, 1828, the Mexican government passed two immigration laws that stayed in effect throughout the rest of this period. And really, it was kind of a carrot and stick approach. They made citizenship pretty easy. 
you just had to live in Mexico for two years or just one year if you were in an area like the Isthmus of Tehuantepec or Texas that was designated for colonization. And then all you had to do to become a Mexican citizen was submit some letters of reference from local officials where you were, declare your intention to be a Mexican citizen, and this might have been the hindrance for a lot of U.S. Americans, be a Catholic. The Americans who moved into Mexico in response to the Mexican government's invitation didn't follow the plan, though. Some stayed for a few years, some for decades. A few did indeed file for Mexican citizenship, but many didn't. Instead, they continued to live as American citizens abroad. And that's where the consuls come in. You know, really, a lot of the U.S. Americans who moved to Mexico took after um, British and French nationals, where they found in a lot of ways they were in a privileged position by living in Mexico as foreigners, because they had the backing of their country's diplomatic and consular corps. First, let's just define a few terms. What is a consul? Well, historian Nicole Phelps, who's writing a history of the U.S. consular service, explains that, quote, consular officials facilitated trade and protected the lives and property of U.S. citizens abroad. Their tasks were myriad, and they carried them out wherever there was need, often in port cities, end quote, like Veracruz. These tasks could include ceremonial appearances, legal intervention, the issuing of paperwork, the care of sick Americans, and so much more. Nicole Phelps points out that the wide-ranging jobs of a consul meant that they needed considerable diplomatic skill, but many didn't actually have much diplomatic training before they got to their job. Consuls aren't the same as ambassadors or ministers. There are a lot more consuls. There's only one minister per country or imperial center, but there can be a consul nearly anywhere there's American trade. In the Republic of Mexico, there were consulates in more than 20 cities in 1845. Just by way of contrast, in 1845, there were around 11 consular posts in France, though the numbers are a bit fuzzy. So why might an American in Mexico need a consul? Well... Consuls are the first line of defense when an American gets into trouble. Americans tended to look with disdain at the laws of the Mexican Republic, and when Mexican officials tried to enforce the law against Americans, those Americans reached out to their closest government representative, which was their consul. American officials in Mexico were paying close attention to how the Mexican government treated other foreign nationals like the British and the French, And they were very sensitive about Americans' rights, identity, and honor. Many times they saw differences in how the British and the French were being treated, and they cried foul. William Taylor, who was a consul in Veracruz before Marmaduke Borough, complained in a report that Americans were going to be unfairly singled out to help reinvigorate the Mexican economy after the Spanish tried to reconquer Mexico in 1829. The Mexican government tried to collect forced loans from foreign nationals to help prop up the government's financial needs. Taylor wrote that the British had a favorable treaty, so they probably wouldn't be subjected to this indignity. The French had a warship in Veracruz Harbor, so they probably wouldn't get subjected to this indignity. When Taylor was writing, no Americans had yet had to provide a forced loan. But Taylor suggested that perhaps an American warship in Veracruz would give their honor the necessary boost to prevent these injustices. This was way outside his purview as a consul. This was, I think, particularly ironic, since the commander of the Mexican Navy in 1829 was David Porter, who had left the American Navy to come and be the commander of the Mexican Navy. This desire for a warship illustrates the difficulty of maintaining the line between legitimate diplomatic intervention and illegitimate overreach. By the way, the United States did not send a warship, at least not in 1829. When an American sloop of war, the Natchez, came into port in Veracruz in 1836, eight of its seamen ended up in prison after getting into a fight with Mexican dock workers. Guess who had to get him out of jail? Yep, Marmaduke Burrow, the consul. To illustrate the tangled webs consuls could get into, we turn back to John Baldwin. 
he and Marmaduke Burrow had a dispute. And the dispute was all about whether Burrow's consular authority could get an American out of trouble with Mexican law. So let's talk about John Baldwin. John Baldwin moved to um, southern Mexico in the early 1820s, apparently moved there with quite a bit of capital, bought this huge chunk of land on the Coatzacoalcos River. That was an area with a lot of interest in both the U.S. and Mexico at that time for a canal between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific. So Baldwin bought this estate right on that river, um, set up a coffee growing operation, sawmill, eventually buys a ship. They're exporting, he and his brother exporting lumber and cochineal to the United States. He does international business with merchants who come in. That got sued in New Orleans in 1828 by a couple of merchants uh, with whom he had a business dispute. And also in that time admitted to bribery of Mexican officials in the court filings there, since he couldn't get in trouble in a New Orleans court for bribery in Mexico. These run-ins aren't the only time Baldwin clashes with the Mexican government. But he also clashes with Burrow when he believes Burrow is taking advantage of him. You know a little bit about Baldwin now, but what kind of a guy was Burrow? He was, in some ways, a career consul. He didn't actually intend to be a consul. He trained as a physician in Philadelphia, but he was also an avid naturalist. He was a member of the American Philosophical Society. Veracruz wasn't his first consular appointment. He was first consul in Lima, Peru, and then in Calcutta, India, before his appointment to Veracruz. While in Lima, he found a new kind of vulture the lesser yellow-headed vulture. The scientific name of this vulture recognizes Burrow's contribution, Cathartes burrovianus. By the way, I think that the Cathartes burrovianus is quite pretty, as vultures go. While he was in Calcutta, Burrow purchased and shipped a rhinoceros back to the United States. This rhinoceros may have been the first rhino to ever set foot in the USA. Even while he was in Mexico, Burrow was involved in naturalist pursuits. But he also had to make a living. So in addition to collecting his consular fees, Burrow was a merchant. John Baldwin and Marmaduke Burrow were associates in two different ways. One of those was in Burrow's role as the U.S. consul in Veracruz. But Burrow, like many other consuls, is a merchant as well. A consul was essentially a side gig for a lot of U.S. merchants in different cities. So Marmaduke Burrow is also working there as a merchant. He and Baldwin are in business together in some way. So that in 1837, when Baldwin is arrested in Minatitlan, in um, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, Burrow tries to intervene in the case, and he even says this, in two different capacities. One is as the U.S. consul defending his citizen. The other is as an associate who is part of the venture that Baldwin is engaged in. Both Juan Sanchez, who's the judge, and um, Luis Gonzaga Cuevas, who's the foreign minister of Mexico, will really have none of it. They basically call Burrow out on this. They say that you really don't have the right as consul to be intervening at this stage of the case anyway, and especially intervening as directly as you do. And then they also say, and you don't have the right as his associate to take part in this case. And they say you trying to have your cake and eat it too really disqualifies you from taking part in the case this way. Not long after this, Baldwin and Burroughs' relationship really breaks down. Baldwin is eventually released. Baldwin gets upset with Burroughs. Really the way that consuls make a lot of their money is through charging fees for certain services, including for, in this case, intervention in the case. So Burroughs is even charging for the paper and stuff like that. And Baldwin believes that Burroughs has overcharged him. And Baldwin is very good at raising a stink. He is amazingly litigious. Baldwin is a somewhat unique case in that he takes out his aggression on both the Mexican government 
and the American consul who's trying to help him. Eventually, this grievance between Burrow and Baldwin arrives at the U.S. House of Representatives. At that point, Baldwin's complaint seems to have been dismissed. But Baldwin is not alone in trying to assert his right to be an American in Mexico. And what that looks like for him and for others is the ability to skirt or outright defy Mexican laws or procedures when it suited him. In fact, in one of his suits against the Mexican government, he explicitly tried to make it a national issue, rather than just a battle between one man and one jurisdiction. And American officials helped him make his case. However, José María Ortiz Monasterio, Mexico's Minister of Foreign Affairs, didn't buy it. Consuls are not only allowing Americans to defy Mexican authority, they're actively encouraging it in many different ways. Along with the minister in Mexico City, consuls issue certificates of citizenship for Americans who stay in Mexico for decades. They repeatedly attempt to undermine Mexican authority both in Mexico and to the government back in Washington. You may have noticed that all the people we've talked about in this story have been white. But they're not the only Americans coming to Mexico. Black Americans are also coming to Mexico in the mid-1800s. Sometimes they're coming for opportunity, but they're also sometimes fleeing for their lives and liberty. How American consuls dealt with black Americans, particularly fugitive slaves, looks quite different from how they dealt with affluent white business people. This will be the topic of a future episode of Consolation Prize, so stay tuned. Now, why does this matter? This is really establishing really a lot of um, U.S. business interests in the future. The U.S. nationals who moved to Mexico in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s really laid the seeds for future U.S. interventions in Mexico and other parts of Latin America, uh, and particularly how U.S. nationals lived abroad with backing from their government. Now, I mean, this wasn't an original U.S. idea. The, the British and French were very active in this. They, they really set a lot of precedents for the future. Um, they really laid the groundwork for the extensive interest that the United States would build in Mexico by the um, late 19th century. Also, they, they were part of the lead up to the U.S.-Mexican War, too, including you know, the way that the consuls backed them up that um, the claims against Mexico that U.S. Americans who lived there and who did commerce there, these started to really rack up to the point where in 1839, the U.S. and Mexico established a claims commission to resolve them. The U.S. State Department was also encouraging these claims with the hopes that um, Mexico's debt on these claims would accumulate so much that the United States might be able to say, well, how about you just give us Alta California in exchange and we'll pay those claimants off? Now, the annexation of Texas and the border dispute between the United States and Mexico that resulted was the main cause. But the, these claims really also fed into narratives uh, that the U.S. was, was expounding of you know, Mexican treachery, Things like that. I mean, you know, some of the language of the consuls and U.S. nationals is very much of the idea of we're a superior civilization. We don't need to obey Mexican laws because the Mexican legal system is inferior to ours and the British system. Also, that you know, in some ways, the U.S.-Mexican War is also partially making the interior of Mexico "quote unquote" safe for business. It's setting a lot of precedents a lot earlier then we usually see them. These people there are laying the seeds for that future expansion into Mexico. So let's return to Marmaduke Burrow. Burrow firmly believed in helping thwart the Mexican government when he thought Americans were being mistreated. He fought hard for Americans, sometimes too hard. But you don't win every fight. In fact, American consuls like him maybe didn't even win most of them, but he kept on trying. 
Since these battles sometimes involved personal entanglements, Burrow had to decide whether he cared more about his own commercial network or about his duty to help U.S. commerce expand into Mexico. In the case of his most irritating constituent, John Baldwin, Burrow eventually made his choice. I herewith return to you your letter received this day's mail, which is of a character that must terminate all personal intercourse between us. And I enjoin it upon you never to address me again on any subject whatsoever, not strictly relevant to the discharge of official duty of my countrymen. Consolation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This week's episode was produced by me, Abby Mullen, and Megan Brett. The music is by Andrew Cody and voice work by Mills Kelly. A special thanks to our experts, David McKenzie and Nicole Phelps. This is our very first episode, so if you enjoyed it, let us know by leaving us a review or a rating on your favorite podcast platform, and we'll see you in three weeks for episode two.